Hello Internet, I'm Ren and this is Ren Rants, a channel where I talk about things I care about with a focus on pop culture. In this video, we're going to take a look at Strange New World Season 2, Episode 8, Under the Cloak of War. I'll give some spoiler-free thoughts and impressions up front before we boldly go into spoiler territory, but I will be sure to give you a warning before we switch gears. Overall, I have mixed feelings about this episode. I'll start with some of the good. The performances here are wonderful. Babs Olusan Makun is particularly superb, and he plays off of Robert Wisdom's guest character so well. The episode mostly focuses on Umbenga and Nurse Chapel's trauma from the Klingon War, and I think it is handled really effectively. We also get some answers to questions that arose in the season two premiere. There were some little moments that I really enjoyed, and I like that we got to see more of Nurse Chapel and Umbenga's friendship. I also enjoyed seeing a bit more of Ortegas in this episode. How each character handles their trauma from the war is interesting, and the story does make an often overlooked point about trauma, which is that there are some traumas that someone who has not experienced it can never fully understand or relate to, no matter how hard they try or want to help. Now, on to the less good stuff, because I would hesitate to call it bad, but there was a lot about this episode that I just didn't enjoy. I think the ending is going to be controversial for a lot of people, and I don't know that the episode did the legwork it needed to for it to justify how dark it goes. And I'm having a hard time reconciling what this means for the characters. The messaging felt a bit questionable to me, and I wish we had more time to really unpack it in the episode, because I don't know if the rest of the season will address it. The musical, which I am super excited for, almost certainly will not, and I'm kind of confident that the season finale is going to be mostly focused on the Gorn. What draws me to Star Trek generally is the light and optimism with which it approaches imagining the future, but despite that, some of Star Trek's darkest episodes are also some of my favorites, so I don't have a problem with Strange New Worlds exploring darker storylines, or exploring the implications of the massive recent war that we saw in Discovery. But something just didn't sit right with me about this episode that I'm having a hard time articulating. It had a lot of similarities to The Next Generation's The Wounded, which handled their subject matter with more nuance in terms of the actual story, despite not going nearly as far as this episode does in exploring how war changes and breaks people. The choice to sandwich this episode between a light-hearted crossover with an animated track show and a musical episode is peculiar. It's a tonal shift so jarring it'll give you whiplash. And this is arguably one of Trek's darkest episodes in terms of how the characters are portrayed. All right, that's about all I can say without spoilers, so this is your warning that there will be spoilers for Strange New Worlds and TNG's The Wounded. I'm going to try to go lighter on the summary so I can get this video out sooner rather than later as I'm still traveling, but I'll still try to hit on the main beats of the episode. A Klingon ambassador and defector, Doc Ra, is visiting the Enterprise. There's a cute moment where they address the boatswain's whistle we hear from time to time. What is that peculiar device? Ah, the boatswain's whistle. An old Earth custom from the time of ships at sea. It's become somewhat of a tradition here on Enterprise for our most distinguished guests. Ra asks for a tour of the ship. I've heard so many great things about the Federation flagship. Could I trouble you for a brief tour of the ship? Ortegas, who fought in the Klingon War, doesn't like that he's here and doesn't trust him. The slaughter at Lombada 5. The siege at Starbase Zeta Athos. I didn't mean to hit a nerve. It's okay. Neither do the Klingons who call him the Butcher of Jagal. You're right. I don't really know what he's about. All I know is the story. There's a reason other Klingons call him the Butcher of Jagal. Which is also the moon both Mbenga and Chapel served on. Ra is publicly anti-Klingon and not impressed by Spock's surprise Raktagino. It has ignited a curiosity in me, a desire to experience more of your culture. There's nothing to experience. They're a warmongering race, limited by ideology. Side note, I love that this seems to be Spock's new cooking hobby from charades coming up again. Ra praises the Federation and generally plays down any appreciation of his own culture. Klingons will never admit it, but the Federation has much better ships. He burns his hand on the Raktagino glass and Pike brings him to sickbay. It mostly seems like a pretext to put Mbenga in an uncomfortable situation with a Klingon again. Mbenga has a panic attack and PTSD episode. We get a flashback of Chapel on a transport to Jagal. She finds out she's going to be the new head nurse and meets Mbenga. Uh, where's the head nurse? I should report in. You haven't heard? Congratulations, head nurse Chapel. They're under-resourced and understaffed. Things get hectic immediately with a transport of injured officers. They try to save one by loading his pattern into the transporter buffer to put him in stasis, kind of like Mbenga will do eventually with his daughter. Back on the Enterprise, Pike has orders from Starfleet to encourage their war veterans to interact with Ra. Apparently there was 
A minor protest during his last transport, so we have direct orders. Klingon war veterans need to interact with Ra. This doesn't make a lot of sense and seems like it would create unnecessary friction, honestly. But Pike invites Chapel and Mbenga to a dinner he's hosting for Ra, and they agree to go. But Mbenga keeps having war flashbacks. We got this. We got this. Ortegas is still having trouble being around Ra. Mbenga gives her a pep talk. Chapel is also struggling with her PTSD, and Spock doesn't know how to help. I didn't know much about your service in the war, but if you ever feel the need to share. Yeah, I don't, so let's just change the subject, yeah? He's a good boy, he means well. In another flashback, we get a reveal that Mbenga was renowned for his combat skills before he became a doctor. Everyone knows his stories. Most hand-to-hand -hand kills confirmed. We finally learn more about the green goo. Protocol 12. No, it's discontinued. When an Andorian seeks to gain an edge against the Klingons. You designed it, right? Make more. Even if I could, I wouldn't. Mbenga refuses to provide it as the Federation stopped producing it. And it turns out that pumping your body full of adrenaline and pain inhibitors is bad for your health. I do find it a bit unbelievable that adrenaline and pain suppressants are enough for a human to 4v1 seasoned Klingon warriors, but... Okay. At the dinner, Ra talks about the Federation saving his life after Jagal, and he has a reaction when he realizes Mbenga was also on Jagal. Ortegas asks him about his escape where he allegedly killed his own men, and then walks out. Ra seems pretty zen about the interaction, though. My sincere apologies, Ambassador Ra. None of need to, Captain. As I said, I bear no grudge. Ra asks Mbenga to practice Mokbara with him. Klingon martial arts, which we've seen a few times over the course of the franchise. In another flashback, Mbenga counsels a young officer who's feeling disillusioned with Starfleet. We have to fight so the people we love can have a chance to live in peace. Shortly thereafter, they have to purge the injured crewmen they had stored in the transporter. Chapel hesitates, but Mbenga does it because more people will die if they don't get the transporter going. Mbenga and Ra spar, and there's an undercurrent of manipulation in how he approaches Mbenga. Met veterans on the ship. They look up to you, and I believe many others in Starfleet will too. Consider joining me for my next peace conference. Mbenga asks if he killed his own men. Did you really kill your own men? He spins a story about killing them because of the atrocities they were committing. Yes, I killed my own men because I was appalled by those atrocities. Mbenga has a PTSD episode about the massacre on Jagal, where many civilians, including children, are being killed. We see the bodies of the Andorian and the young officer we saw him speaking to earlier. Mbenga grabs a Klingon Duktag knife and walks off. Mbenga takes the green goo and goes after the Klingon. Oh boy, here I go killing again. And Nurse Chapel encourages him to make them pay. And when you find whoever's in charge, you make them pay. Una tells Pike they need to get Ra off the ship because the crew morale is low with him around. Back in sick bay with Ra, Mbenka confronts him because he gave the order that resulted in all of the civilian casualties on Jagal. Leave me alone. Don't let hate ruin your soul. You gave the order! And it turns out, Mbenga is the real butcher of Jagal. Give them fight the hardest. It was Captain Release. He held me back while you made your escape. And Ra simply abandoned his men to be killed by Mbenga, all hopped up on Protocol 12. You turned me into a monster. Mbenga essentially gives the exact same speech we got from O'Brien in the TNG episode, The Wounded. All of this time you've said nothing in it. Because unlike you, I am ashamed of that night. Again, I don't blame Babs Olusan Makun for how much I didn't like this episode at all. His performance was excellent and so was his delivery of that speech. Ra tries to convince Mbenga that his work justifies the lies. Using the blood on my hands to make yourself a saint? Look at the work that I've done! People need saints. Mbenga gets his murder and knife out of the box and ominously tells Ra, Why couldn't you leave me alone? There's a struggle that we can't see because it's obscured by tinted glass, but we see enough to know that Ra has been stabbed and falls to the ground. Chapel witnessed it, also through the glass, and covers for Mbenga. They run a DNA analysis on the knife, and it reveals that it was the knife used to kill the other Klingons in charge of the massacre, so they assume the knife was Ra's. Pike checks on Mbenga, who claims he didn't start the fight, but he's also not sorry that Ra is dead. What are you saying? I told you I didn't start the fight. But I'm glad he's dead. Pike tries to defend the Federation. Even if he had secrets, there's due process. That's why we have tribunals. The diplomatic corps knew who he was, and they still let him represent the Federation. And Mbenga claims Ra deserved to pay for what he did. The Federation believes everyone deserves a second chance. 
What about justice? Doesn't everyone deserve to pay for their actions? There was a malfunctioning bio bed in sickbay this episode that Mbenga repairs, which seems to be a metaphor for PTSD and the way it stays with you even as you try to manage it. And we see the bio bed flickering again at the end of the episode, despite Mbenga's efforts. I do like that this episode spent some time showing us Chapel and Mbenga's friendship and how it was forged in the crucible of war and how far they'll go for each other, especially when it relates to their shared trauma. I just wish we could have spent more time on that this episode. As I said, the episode does remind me a bit of The Wounded, a TNG episode episode where a Starfleet captain goes rogue in an effort to stop the Cardassians from covertly transporting and stockpiling weapons. In this episode, we spend some time with the transporter chief, O'Brien, who fought against the Cardassians in the war, and it deals with many of the same themes of trauma and difficulty moving on after war. I was on Setlick 3 with Captain Maxwell the morning after the massacre. I was with a group of women and children, and two Cardassian soldiers burst in. One of the women threw me a phaser, and I fired. The man just, just incinerated there before my eyes. I'd never killed anything before. It's not you I hate, Cardassian. I hate what I became because of you. But I think the approach felt more nuanced in the way the Cardassians were ultimately transporting weapons, and Picard knew it, but chose not to act aggressively on that knowledge in an effort to prevent escalation of hostilities. Cargo ships running with high energy subspace fields that jam sensors. If you believe the transport ship was carrying weapons, Captain, why didn't you board it as Maxwell requested? I was here to protect the peace. It approached the Cardassians as being more nuanced than simply bad guys, even though they were doing something in the wrong. In Under the Cloak of War, it feels like they try to toe this line as well, but I think the Klingons ultimately come off as flat villains with very little depth, slaughterers of children, etc., which honestly seems uncharacteristically dishonorable. I have a hard time buying it, and we've heard mixed things about whether Klingons take prisoners, but come on. While the messaging about some things being unforgivable is something I agree with in real life, in the context of this episode, it deprives the ending of a level of moral grayness that they were going for, and it ends up being like, I don't know, morally sepia or something. Although, I still just have a hard time believing Mbenga would. Best case scenario here, have a knife ready and bait that enfeebled diplomat into a fight, or worst case, actually just straight up murder this guy. The ambiguity they were going for is interesting, but I think it loses some of its punch when the victim isn't all that ambiguous, and Mbenga clearly took that knife out with intention. The point about the Federation knowingly harboring a war criminal and covering it up for their own interests is interesting, but doesn't have enough time to really be explored in the episode. It's also hard for me to buy that Ra's peace work was particularly useful since he's seen as dishonorable by the Klingons for killing his own men, and members of the Federation don't seem to be comfortable around him either, so I'm not sure what he can really accomplish for the Federation besides being a token Klingon used to praise them. I guess I'm just not quite getting why that's all that useful for them. I kind of think the way Strange New Worlds handles Klingons, so far at least, feels surprisingly one-dimensional given the depth with which they've been explored in other Trek shows. I think this episode could really have worked and been a standout as one of Star Trek's best and darkest with just a little more care and polish, but for me it just kind of missed the mark despite doing a lot of things well. I'm also worried that with only two episodes left in the season, one of which is a musical, the real weight and consequences of this episode might not really be addressed. I mean, a diplomat is dead. I think it strains a bit against the episodic format, and I am a smidge disappointed with it. This episode is one I may follow up on eventually when I've had more time to ruminate on it, but for now I'll leave it here. Let me know what you thought of Under the Cloak of War in the comment section down below. I know a lot of people really love this episode, so I kind of feel like the odd one out here. Anyways, like, share, and subscribe for more videos. See you next time. Peter Zane.